Or do you think that all things are lawful? That line references Dostoevsky. He wrote allegorical epics that were world-renowned because people could relate to his character's angst and their questioning of modern life. That line is integral to a theme based on the Grand Inquisitor's story in the Brothers Karamazov. I understand why that line was cut from the movie. It's obscure and so its meaning might be lost. Still, I feel it's important because the meaning behind all things are lawful has been misunderstood to the 20th century. Its misconstrued meaning has influenced Western civilization as we know it. I'm not a well-read person, but from what I've read, there is a bridge between Dostoevsky, who is a devout Christian, and Ayn Rand, who is a secular objectivist, and the morals that these authors have conveyed. I'm certain that Rand's influences included existentialism, a way of thinking and understanding that the, the world, which is originally expounded by Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre supported his treatise with an axiom based on Dostoevsky's text. Sartre said, if God does not exist, everything would be permitted. Now, just because Dostoevsky wrote about characters who challenged spiritual concepts and voiced existential questions, it doesn't mean that Dostoevsky himself was an atheist nor an existentialist. The author's character, Ivan Karamazov, a man in crisis, his soul on the brink, he spoke the words, all things are lawful. Ivan's younger brother, Alexis, religiously devout and idealistic, countered that if all things are lawful, then there is no sin. The phrase, it originated in the Christian New Testament, uh, Corinthians 10.23. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. In layman terms, that means we are free to do all things, but there are some things, none of which we should do. We are free to do all things, but not all things are for the common good. In the context of Christianity, Paul is instructing the Corinthians on practices so they can be cleansed from sin through a covenant with God. Paul's method is logically Aristotelian. It's A is not B. All things, but not all things. Yet, how this logic was interpreted has repercussions that resonate today. Sartre's existentialism questioned the validity of Christianity, of all religions, on whether or not sin exists. If sin exists, then humans are all flawed from the beginning. Ayn Rand sought to resolve this by arguing that sin does not exist, that people are perfect from the start, and we only need to unlearn our indoctrinated false truths. To that end, Rand declared the objectivist oath, I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for the sake of mine. Live by that oath, and you embody the virtue of selfishness. But many people do not understand it. They use it as an excuse to be selfish at the expense of others. This way of life dominated in it the 20th century since Atlas Shrugged was published in the late 1950s. Then the rich and powerful had their second Bible for cherry-picking their values as they rose to the top and accomplished their self-serving agendas. Now, of course, not all rich and powerful people are bad, and not all 
not all these books, well, they're not the source for blaming. It's what's in our hearts, what we choose to take from the books, what we choose to believe according to our own direction of our own moral compass. I believe in an unwritten rule that is logically inferred from Ayn Rand's oath, a rule of reciprocity. If two people act on Rand's oath, serve their own interests first, and find that they can serve each other in equal value, equal trade, then the ethic of reciprocity is fulfilled. The way I see it, this is the bridge between the two schools of thought, where Dostoevsky offers a spiritual perspective and Rand offers an individualistic one. Both are moral and both are conducive to building up a community to edify. Whether you are Paul instructing the Corinthians or Sartre liberating the secular humanists or the secular humans, no matter what gender, color, or partisan line, we all have a community to edify. In my story, Casualties of the State, the screenplay, the cabal of war profiteers believe that all things are lawful. So, they are willing to serve their own interests at the expense of others. They are achieving their ends through the means of certain powers not unlike the temptations that Dostoevsky described through Ivan Karamazov's dream. And in this dream, it is another story. The story of the Grand Inquisitor from the Inquisition condemning Christ. As uh, many of you know, Christ rejected the temptations offered by the terrible spirit of self-annihilation and destruction. Christ rejected evil, but the Grand Inquisitor and his church embraced an institutionally empowered evil, enslaving humanity in a cage that transcends all sovereign bodies, all boundaries across our world. In a nutshell, that's what Dostoevsky said. Our hero in my story, or anti-hero, he faces a cabal that is evil because they are using these ancient powers to enjoy their kingdom on earth at the expense of its people. What are those powers, you might ask? Let's put it this way. Christ offered, Christ was offered by the devil uh, three powers, three temptations. Um, Christ embodied th three gifts, gift to humanity. One was miracle, another was mystery, and the other was authority. Now he expressed these three gifts in a form of love. The, in order to free humankind. But the devil wanted to take those three gifts and turn them into powers, corrupt them. Uh, and those powers become, miracle becomes, uh, miracle, mystery, authority, miracle becomes sorcery, sorcery. Uh, because you know, Christ turns the bread into loaves, so feed the people and they'll follow you. Well, that's sorcery, right? If you do that to that end, so people will follow you, then that is sorcery. That's the power, right? Feed the people and they will follow you. We see that today. Feed the people and they will follow you. Think on that. Two, miracle, mystery. Mystery becomes... Kind of like an occult, occult, right? A secret 
power, something hidden. Uh, he, the devil said, throw yourself off a, a building, off a cliff, God will catch you. You can prove that you're the son of God, that you're a divine power, and they will follow you. Perform an occult action so they will follow you and bow down before you. Well, he rejected that. He'd rather have his resurrection yeah, as a... So, well, anyway, there are powers of the occult in this day. You know? Three, authority. Right? Have a kingdom on earth. Well, Christ wanted a kingdom of heaven. He didn't want to rule over people on earth. So what does that mean? What power is that? Tyranny. Tyranny. Rule a kingdom on earth in tyranny. Okay? So now that we're caught up, I'll read you another passage. We shall triumph and shall be Caesars. And with that, they don't just inherit the earth, they rule it. They tell you they're planning a universal happiness of mankind, yet they'd burn the world before relinquishing it to the people. That passage was said by the anti-hero in our story, in the original screenplay. In a way, he's echoing the Dostoevsky's uh, story. He's echoing the temptations that were taken by the institution. So, our hero faces a cabal that is evil because they are using these ancient powers to enjoy their kingdom on earth at the expense of its people. He sees what is harming those whom he loves in his community, and our nation is his community. Here, he has taken a moral stand for the common good. He heeds a calling to strike down that which straddles atop a beast, to remove those who suppress a noble foundation. He is every man without sin, born into a sinful world, this everyman, in transcending the illusion of sin and the self-imposed limitations of humanity, becomes Ubermensch, a superman. In a way, that is a lesson that I want to impart, that anyone can rise and become the light of this world. However, as good as that may sound, There are consequences. Why go to the extreme? Our hero, in his deepest ego, considered himself an ubermensch, a superman, but not in the heroic sense. He was above humanity's conventional morality. He chose to kill the members of the cabal for what he perceived is the greater good. Otherwise, Again, in case he didn't know, the cabal puts America into another war under false pretenses. Okay, in case you haven't caught that detail. So by eliminating the cabal, no more war. However, there's another character in the no in this screenplay. Uh, an, um, an FBI agent by the name of Philip. And Philip insists that no individual alone can decide the greater good. His accustomed moral standard is one that trusts in a higher sovereign power, be it God or society, or the government. After all, he works for the government. But, uh, but our uh, character, our hero, or anti-hero, would counter that the sovereign is prone to corruption by the elite. Now again, not all elites are bad, right? We have Atlas Shrugged, we have the Oath, we have uh, the top, the elite, the the creative class, and the bot, the lower is the people who support that and consume the creation, whatever, you know. That's a whole other topic, but I'm not saying that not all elites are bad. 
but the cabal, the people who are selfish at the expense of others, that's the problem. And this elite cabal, they are motivated by hatred. They took advantage of the sovereign power, the national intelligence apparatus, and subverting that to throw our country into war, that's subverting the sovereign power. They do that at the expense of humanity, of our own citizens, and of humanity in general. Again, selfishness at the expense of others. It's a corruption of the objectivist oath. Now, all while humanity puts faith and trust in God, and in that way, God, what they perceive as God, I might argue, is an imperfect earthly manifestation. It's not the true God, or Logos, but a sovereign, corruptible institution. Okay? Anything that is an institution, whether it's a government, organization, a partnership, a church, anything that is an institution on earth is susceptible to corruption. I know that many people will disagree with me on that point, but hear me out here. Our hero, or anti-hero, steps outside of humanity to eliminate this cancer, this cabal. Our, he acted out of love, not hatred, through this murderous action. And yet this action would be characterized by humanity as hatred. That's why he steps out of it, of humanity. We can't deny that he is desperately, utterly human. Yet he is extraordinary for embracing the light and the dark toward his own end. Now, is this end right or wrong? Good or evil? That's for you to decide. That's what I want the audience to think about. How do we know if his choice was right or wrong? We do know one thing. The consequence for our hero was loss of love. He is forever separated. He cannot return to humanity. Now, you can paint this story with a Western, Judeo-Christian, or Islamic perspective, where our hero is lost between good and evil, Christ and Satan. But that's not quite where I found him. Consider adding an Eastern perspective and blending it in. He is a, forgive me if I mispronounce, because I'm not all that well-read, but for, forgive me. He is a Dharma Pala, or Dharma Defender. Now, Dharma is a key concept with multiple meanings in various religions, but in this case, uh, we're looking at Hindu and Buddhist concepts about a right, correct way of living cosmic law and order. That's what Dharma is. So he is defending that. It's like an Ubermensch, but more. And a Dharma defender is a wrathful deity, a protector of the law. Now that, a Dharma Pala, originates from, again, forgive me, Vajrayana Buddhism. Now Vajrayana is a kind of Buddhist thought and practice that emerged in 6th century India. Practitioners consider it to be an advanced form of Buddhism characterized by ritualistic and secret teachings where their goal in life, or through reincarnation, is to become a bodhisattva, a savior of sentient beings. I find that interesting because secret teachings, you have a Dharma defender, which by its nature arises out of secret teachings and secret knowledge 
not well known by humanity as a whole and fighting against the cabal which by its nature is a hidden secret manifestation so you have a battle in this story in this movie or screenplay or novel you have a battle between forces that are hidden from humankind so i hope to think that's interesting so the dharma defender is a embodiment of compassion that that act in a wrathful way for the benefit of sentient beings while they service humanity they are outside of it separate from humanity now back to the judeo-christian perspective being separate from what you love that's a consequence and that that is truly sin. And Jonathan, who was the other FBI partner, he knows that sin is separation from what and whom you love. And in the story, he's bruised and broken and distraught about his grief-stricken partner, Philip. And, he, and so Jonathan returns home to his wife. But he also grieves for our hero, anti-hero. He grieves for him, too. He knows, he knows that what he did was necessary to prevent our country from going to war under false pretenses, to, to prevent the sacrifice of our countrymen in exchange for the gain of a few, elite. He understood that was necessary. But he wouldn't wish that role on anyone. He knows, and he's seen shades of it in his own past, especially in a war zone, because he himself was in Vietnam. My own father was, uh, during the Vietnam era, was stationed in Korea. Uh, it's just fucked up. God forbid, God save us all. It's a warning. It's a warning for anyone considering the path of a Superman, a Dharma defender, or whatever. We're all human, so be ready to accept the consequences.